Hi everyone and welcome to Biology Professor. Today we're focusing on an introduction to viruses. Viruses cause a number of important human diseases. For example, measles, mumps, HIV, polio, influenza, SARS, hepatitis. These are all important human diseases. So this is why we study viruses. Before we get into talking about what a virus looks like, what its structure is like, let me ask you a question. Are viruses alive? It seems like a pretty straightforward question, right? But I think it's actually fairly complicated, and it's not something that people give a lot of thought to. In order to decide whether or not a virus is alive, let's look at the definition of a virus. We know that viruses are a small, non-cellular, infectious particle that contains both protein and nucleic acid that cannot reproduce by itself. Let me draw your attention to two factors. First, viruses are non-cellular and they cannot reproduce by themselves, meaning they can't reproduce outside of a host. Now, usually when we think of something that's being alive, it's at least made up of one cell, if not many cells. Also, in order for life to happen, you have to be able to reproduce, right? So both of these things would suggest that no, viruses are not alive. More evidence to this fact includes the case that viruses do not have ribosomes. These are the organelles that synthesize proteins. So viruses are not capable of protein production. Also, viruses cannot make energy. They're not capable of normal cellular metabolism, so they can't generate ATP. So most people, the general thought is that no, viruses are not alive. They're just very complex sort of machines. You can think of them in that way. However, some people point out, truthfully, that viruses do have numerous capabilities that is required for life. For example, they respond to their environment, they cause disease, they are ca capable of replication once they're in a host cell, and they are also able to evolve. For example, this is why we need a flu shot every year, because the flu virus changes so much over time that we need to keep being immunized against it. So when asking, is a virus alive, most of the time the answer is no, but depending on your textbook and your teacher, sometimes the question is, we're not really sure. It's a little bit of a gray area. Okay, so now let's talk about virus structure. All viruses have two main components. These are a nucleic acid core, this would be the genome. And this nucleic acid core is surrounded by a protein coat that is called the capsid. The capsid is what protects the nucleic acid core from the environment. The capsid is also important for allowing a virus to enter into a host cell and then be transmitted out of a host cell again. The nucleic acid core is where we find a lot of the diversity between different types of viruses. The nucleic acid core can be made up of double-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded DNA, or single-stranded RNA. And there are different replication um, mechanisms for these different types of viruses. Also, that nucleic acid core can be circular or it can be linear. It can even be segmented, which means more than one linear piece of nucleic acid. Now, to also indicate the range of diversity among viruses, let's talk about how many nucleotides are common in a viral genome. Nucleotides, of course, are the building blocks that make up DNA and RNA. The smallest viral genomes are about 3,000 nucleotides. The largest viral genomes are about 250,000 nucleotides. So you can see that there's quite a range here where the viruses that have more nucleotides, they have more genetic information, they are generally more complex. Now, just to put this in perspective, though, how many nucleotides do you think are in the human genome, for example? Humans, it's about 3.2 billion nucleotides. 
So you can see that while there is certainly a range here for viruses, all viruses are far less complex than an organism like a human being. Now also, some viruses have an additional component called an envelope. The envelope is made of lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. And the envelope is important because it can actually help to mask the virus from the immune system. This is because viruses that are enveloped take this envelope from the host cell membrane when they exit the host cell, so that when the immune system sees this envelope, it actually thinks that it's just seeing a host cell. So this is one of the ways that viruses can evade the immune system. Now, if we look at virus shapes, there is a fairly large diversity here. For example, with bacteriophages, these are viruses that infect bacteria cells. We have this capsid structure, the nucleic acid, and there's also a component where the bacteriophage uses these things that kind of look like little legs to attach to the bacteria cell and then inject the DNA. So this is what a bacteriophage looks like. If you'd like more information on how the bacteriophage works, you can see my video on transduction. There is also tobacco mosaic virus. Tobacco mosaic virus is quite small, and it is elongated. Of course, this is the virus that infects the plant, the tobacco plant. Another example of a shape that a virus can take is poliovirus. Poliovirus is quite small. It's still got that capsid shape with the nucleic acid core, but it's much smaller than some of these other viruses. Another example of a different shape that a virus can take is Ebola virus. Ebola virus sort of forms this long loop-like structure of the capsid with the nucleic acid inside it. Also important to think about is the size of these viruses. Now, viruses are typically 20 to 100 nanometers in size. This is quite small when you think that the average bacterial cell is upwards of a thousand nanometers, and the average animal cell, like human cells, are upwards of 10,000 nanometers. So you can see how small these structures are compared to the host cells that they are infecting. Okay, now let's talk about viral replication. Viral replication is extremely complex. This is because there are so many different types of viruses that replicate through different mechanisms. For example, with bacteriophages, those viruses that infect bacterial cells, they actually just attach to the bacterial cell, inject the nucleic acid into the cell, while the viral capsid remains on the outside. On the other hand, animal viruses, they actually enter the animal cell capsid and all. There are also numerous different mechanisms for the different types of nucleic acid core. This means that RNA viruses and DNA viruses have different mechanisms. Um, some RNA viruses are able to copy their RNA directly into proteins. Others have to transcribe a complementary strand before that can happen. You also have retroviruses that take their RNA genome, reverse transcribe it into DNA, which then gets integrated with the host genome and copies that way. On the other hand, DNA viruses have to use post cellular machinery to copy their DNA. So you can see that this can become very complicated. For today, we're just going to use the example of an animal cell virus, so a virus that infects animal cells that has a DNA core. Let's start over here. In black, we have the cell. Here we have the red nucleic acid core, the blue capsid, and the green envelope. Note that the virus envelope attaches to the cell plasma membrane via a, a receptor-mediated fashion. 
This step is called attachment. Once attachment occurs, then you have the second step, which is endocytosis. Note that the attachment relies on specific receptors. This is what gives the virus what's called host restriction. It's only able to infect cells of a specific host based on the receptors that are present. Then the endocytosis occurs. Note that once the virus enters the cell, what has actually happened here is the green envelope of the virus fuses with the cell membrane. You can see here that we had what was once the cell membrane fused with what was once the viral envelope. This means that what actually comes inside the cell is just the capsid surrounded by, or excuse me, the capsid surrounding the nucleic acid core. The next step is uncoating. Uncoating is when host cell proteins are used to actually break down the capsid, resulting in the nucleic acid core then being available for replication. Now, following this uncoating process, various things have to happen. First, the DNA gets replicated. This happens in the nucleus. Why does it happen in the nucleus, you might ask? Why is that important? Well, remember that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. They are only capable of replicating inside a host cell. The reason for this is that they must use host cell machinery in order to replicate, because they don't have all of the proteins and nucleotides and amino acids that they need in order to form new virus particles. Now, where is the host cell machinery for DNA replication? Well, it's in the nucleus, because that's where the host cell's DNA is. Now, if you had an RNA genome in a virus, it could actually be replicated in the cytoplasm, because it doesn't need that DNA replication machinery. While the DNA is being replicated, you also have capsid proteins being made. happens in the cytoplasm. Why do you think that is? Well, think about where proteins are made. They're made by ribosomes, which are organelles that are present in the cytoplasm. So the fact that protein synthesis is happening in the cytoplasm, it makes sense. Once you have the DNA replicated and the capsid proteins produced, the next step is viral assembly. This is just when the replicated DNA genomes are packaged inside the capsids to form a structure like this. The final step is called membrane fusion and release. Membrane fusion and release is how the new virus particles acquire an envelope. They basically move to the outside of the cell and then they fuse with the host cell membrane and then they exit the cell and are released. This means that the envelope that is covering these new virus particles is actually taken directly from the host cell. And as we discussed before, this is an important mechanism that viruses use to evade the immune system. Because when immune system cells sense that viral envelope, what they're actually recognizing is host cell components, and thus the virus can travel to a new host cell to continue its infection cycle um, without being stopped by the immune system. So that is the basics of viral replication. That's all I've got for today, so I hope you learned a lot, and thank you for watching Biology Professor.